so good to be together together today and if you've got a bible could you um grab a bible and go to the book of ephesians um are we facebook live in this tim notice it is going live well welcome everybody in the world all the billions and billions of people watching this haha -ha. um so excited about alpha thanks guys for sharing about that as well i think um it is true to say that from a very young age, all of us, uh, maybe unconsciously, um, ask ourselves this question, which is, who am I? Who am I? And I think it's a really good question. Um, I think it's a really profound question. I think it's a universal question. I think no matter what kind of um, country you're from or background you're from, this, this, uh, this deep longing to have a sense of clarity over who you are, who we are as people, I think is hardwired into us as people. And what we tend to do is... Uh, is that we take hold of, maybe even at the unconscious level, various like labels that we then start to wear. Even from when we're little kids, we do this unconsciously because we're hardwired to ask this question, who am I? Who am I? Um, as we grow up, we inevitably, if you've got brothers and sisters, you'll start to answer that question often through comparing yourself. You'll wear a label of like, well, I'm the youngest one or I was the oldest one. Or I'm the golden child in comparison with my crazy siblings. Um, we go through life and from the youngest age we start asking this question and we, we attempt to answer that question of who am I, that search for significance, that kind of almost like longing for some sense of self. We answer it through grabbing hold of so many different labels that are available around the, in this world that we live. So let me just be very you know, personal for a moment. So wh when I was going to what uh, in America we called elementary school, primary school, um, I realized that during that time, the main kind of unconscious label, sense of identity that I kind of had, <laughs> believe, believe it or not, was probably like the funny guy. Uh, my abiding memory of being at primary school was just laughing all the time with my best mate Ben Charity and me. We were giggling away for many, many years. It was I was we were like the funny guys. And then, to my great surprise, when I was 11, I got a scholarship. Can I have a woo? Thank you, a woo, uh, um, to a prestigious middle school. And suddenly, I started to wear unconsciously. My label shifted to like the clever one. And it was totally unconscious, but this was probably the abiding memory or like the identity in that period. And then during that time, I also hit puberty and puberty was not a friend to Tom Shaw. Oh my word, my skin exploded with acne from 11 or 12. My hair, I know it's not exactly a, a thing of beauty even now, but believe me, it was horrendous. Maybe it was the pubatic hormones flowing through my body. Jared can help me understand that. But basically, my hair was big and frizzy and horrendous. I had huge, cheesy glasses. And um, I also went to a school that was just for boys. So it didn't help me learn how to be normal around women. And, and, and so another label I unconsciously started to wear, as well as the clever one, was the ugly one. Can I have an R? Uh... Oh, thank you. No, it's true, though. I felt desperately um, ugly. <laughs> and let's be honest, maybe I was. No, but um, I, I started to wear that label. And then I finished high school and started to, um, like, hitchhike around Canada, snowboarding. And um, basically, then I went into another phase of my life where the label I was wearing was probably, like, the laid-back one. And here I am now in California. Oh, irony of ironies. The Mecca, the birthplace of the hippie movement, where a big label that is on offer is the laid back label. Yeah? You know that whole thing of like, I don't really, I don't really ever get, you know, um, bothered by anything. That's an identity. 
Yeah, it's a sense of self. This is who I am. I'm, and I remember thinking, oh, yeah, that's a great label. Uh, I'll grow my hair a bit, have a nose ring, smoke pot. That seems kind of like good. Everyone's, everyone's so, everyone's so kind of like aggressive and into money. I'm just going to kind of be like a, a peace dude. And, uh, and that was my next label. And so we carry on. And the reality is, this, I want to just be real. This is a foundation today I'm just wanting to lay is that the question is a good question, who am I? But the labels we tend to uh, choose from the world around us, I, I just want to almost start to suggest humbly that they're not always the best labels to wear. As we get older, this craving for identity doesn't go away. We just shift the kind of labels that we unconsciously wear. You know, I mean, my goodness, the label of being a San Franciscan, which means you wear Patagonia, you have certain political views, you have a dog, you, you know, I mean, it's such a strong label, right? And I'm not even against that label. I quite like that label. But that, that the identity, you know, or being British, oh my goodness, like it's such a strong, or being American your nationality, or being Spanish. You know, it gives you a strong, strong sense of significance and identity. Um, we can, you know, there's, honestly, there's no end to the kind of variety of things that you can take your identity in, from your gender to your sense of beauty or ugliness, how wealthy you are, what kind of house you live in, where you live, your body image, um, your job, you know, I mean, there's so many on offer. And so before I go any further, um, this is always a dangerous thing, but a fun thing. I want to just give you guys just a moment just to unmute yourself and be just three or four of you be vulnerable. Uh, just give us a, a, a label that springs to mind for you that you think, yeah, this is a label I, I know I tend to wear. OK. We're family, right? So don't, don't hold back. Just unmute yourself and just give us the word or two. A little bit of feed, little bit of interaction. So it's not just me. Come on. I'll pick on you. I'm that mean. Come on, I can see some of you leaning forward. Oh, yeah, this is my label. Sarah, come on. I can see you leaning. Sarah Gallagher. <laughs> I'm the loud one. Okay. Bless you, sister. Okay. Uh, I'm the emotional one. Thank you, Jared. Let's have a few more. The bold and reckless one. Thank you, Billy. The laid back one. Thank you, Mike. Have two more. The adventurous one. Thank you, Phil. One more. What would you say, Josie? <laughs> if in doubt, ask your wife. I knew you were going to get me involved. Come on, she's... I'm running over. She's running over. I'm ra I wasn't allowed to be on screen today. Um, I would say, like, bubbly, happy one. Right, that's, a, that's helpful. So here's the problem. The question is a very healthy question. I would say it's fundamental to being a human. The problem is that the labels we often tend to pick lead to to one of two different states which are both equally destructive. If we fundamentally, primarily use a label that's from the world or the flesh or the devil, the three uh, classic um, expressions in the Bible of where we can go wrong, we either live in pride or in despair. I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but it's true. For example, if you, um, I don't know, so your label is, I'm a successful businessman. Okay, that's unconscious, but it's the thing that really makes you feel significant. Then ultimately, if you feel like, you know, the cards have fallen in good places and that is being fulfilled, 
it's almost inevitable you'll feel some level of pride and superiority. The problem, of course, is, is that when at some point that doesn't happen, maybe even forced retirement at some, at some point or unemployment or whatever it might be, rather than being able to just you know, see it as this part of your life, if it's an identity issue, you can actually swing very quickly to a kind of despair or a condemnation. So when we live defined by labels other than we see in scripture, they're not necessarily entirely wrong, I'm not saying that, but when they become primary issues of identity, primary things we live by, what happens is we tend to pendulate between pride and despair, pride and despair, and that is absolutely exhausting. So if your identity is, I'm super mum, whilst the kids are all shiny and happy and doing well, you can be feeling okay, maybe secretly proud, and then suddenly they hit a certain patch in their life and no matter what you do, they all go absolutely crazy and nuts. And suddenly, the despair and the condemnation and the shame you can feel is absolutely crushing. So there's a thousand different options to choose from in terms of labels that will ultimately lead to um, a kind of both ultimately a pride or despair in our hearts, both of which are significantly destructive. So if you would say you're marked in life by highs and lows and highs and lows, listen up. This may be unconsciously something that is defining you more than you realize. The other interesting thing about, I would say, all labels or identities apart from the ones in the Bible is that they're very tiring. So let me ask this question. Do you feel quite exhausted? Now, I know life is busy uh, for all of us, so I'm not just saying in a kind of uh, a shallow way but if there's like this deep soul fatigue where you just feel like there's a kind of heaviness in your life at times often that's because the thing you're doing has shifted from this part of who you are to like a it's almost like entirely who you are and you're trying to sustain something and actually this thing that's going to be a good gift of God is you're, you're trying to um, sustain its reality because it's conditional. It's based on our performance, isn't it? Any of these kind of labels are things that we have to sustain. Worldly labels, worldly identities are, are terrible slave masters. They are terrible, um, heavy, condemning things that demand constant energy and um, attention to them. And here's the interesting twist many of us watching this would uh, call ourselves Christians and to be a Christian one way of putting this is that we are those who believe that Jesus Christ has given us a whole new set of identity these glorious um, expressions of, of, of self that God now gives us a gift and we're going to look at these over the next few weeks in Ephesians today is a more setting up the problem in a way so that we are hungry to hear what Jesus says but the challenge is, for many of us as Christians, even though we might say, oh yeah, we believe with our words that I am a child of God and I am forgiven and I am blessed and I am redeemed and I am holy. But often the actual reality of our lives is that honestly there's very little difference emotionally between us and our friends who wouldn't say they're Christians. <laughs> that the identity is kind of out there, it's not actually in here. Anyone identify with that? Where you feel like it's kind of like bouncing off you. It's sort of over there, it's, it's this, this heady truth that I kind of believe. It's not in me. It's not deeply in me. And I think one of the reasons why is because we simply haven't unhurriedly understood the grandeur, if I might say, of God's labels that he gives us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as a gift. The, the, the hugeness of the identity that he now gives. I mean, just so you know, you know, to be a Christian in biblical terms is not like, oh, I used to vote one political party and now I've changed to another. I used to vote for the Redskins and now I vote for another team. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's like this massive, huge, like cosmically significant identity shift that has happened by the grace of God 
that is so huge and so massive and so glorious and weighty, the Apostle Paul, even though he had a brain the size of Jupiter, even he, you can tell, is struggling to get his mind around the magnitude of the new sense of labels and identity that are offered as a great gift by Jesus. Nothing to do with performance, not coming in and out when you feel good or when you feel bad, but never, ever changing, never shifting. And uh, I want to just actually, if we can, I think either Tim or Amanda has a, a chart I would like to um, present before you that's going to help us as we dive into Ephesians and this first section, which talks a lot about the new identity that we're to live by. Um, there is a really helpful chart that I want to, um, you can scribble this down. It's very easy to remember. This was first, I first saw this by a guy called Jeff Vanderstelt, great name. And he presented this and it's kind of, it's really helped me understand um, issues of identity. So he made the point that basically you can see four boxes and that the flow of scripture typically fo follows these four steps. Number one, who God is. It's about him and his character. Then number two, it's then t typically about what God has done, his activity. And then typically it's about, therefore, as a result of the activity of God, now, who we are as people, Christians. And then finally, box four is therefore what we now do in response to boxes one, two, and three. So boxes one, two, and three are overtly about God. And boxes one and three at the top, as you can see, are about like character and being. And, and boxes two and four are about activity. So, for example, let me give you just an example to get your mind around it. You know, you could say box one, who, who, who God is. Because God is creative, therefore, number two, God made the cosmos. Okay, because of who he is, his character, it flows out into what God does in terms of his activity. And then number three, not just because of what he's done generally, but because of his activity and what he has done, for Christians, they believe that God has done something that was ultimately nothing to do with any activity that we had anything to do with. That God has made us children of God, his beloved, part of his people, as a grace gift entirely by the action of somebody else. And then finally, box four is what we do. And uh, this is an incredibly helpful visual aid that has so many immediate profound points to it. The first point is this. If you look at this, and if this is even half true about the Bible, that it's mainly about who God is and what God has done and who God has made us to be, then let me ask this obvious question. Who is the Bible in a sense most talking about? Is it most talking about us or is it in a way more heavily focused actually on God himself? I think I think we tend to make the Bible just about us. And I think the first thing to realize is it's true to say that the Bible, in many ways, primarily is about somebody else, which, which we're going to see isn't bad news. It isn't that God doesn't want us to understand how precious we are, but that we are hard, hardwired to actually be far more content in life when our eyes, yes, are on us, but in a deeper sense, they're actually focused on somebody else. Um, that we're not just living in isolation trying to figure out life on our own. But fundamentally, when we look at the Bible, it's an incredible story about who God is, what God's done, who God's made us to be. So, for example, because God is loving, number one. Number two, he made all around us. But because we, you know, humans went wrong, we, we fell, sin came into the world. Box two is that God sent his only son to die in our place, to rise from the dead and offer forgiveness. And therefore, box three, God has given Christians new life, new faith as a gift. So what this does is immediately it starts to lift the weight of us who naturally tend to all live in box four. Just give me a little wave here. If you think at a practical level, a lot of your life tends to be about box four. You know, what I have to do, my activity in life, the things that I feel like I should be doing to be either a good Christian or just a good citizen of this world. Yeah. It's fascinating how much of our life 
is actually defined by box 4. But this chart helps us to understand that the reality is, is that we are primarily those whose, whose inner disposition is made to understand who God is and what God has done and who God has made us. So that box three there is really where we're going to be mainly focused on over the next few weeks as we look at identity. Who God has made us to be or what labels the Bible now gives us. When we live simply with labels that the world offers, which I mentioned earlier, i.e. the world's equivalent to box three, it's like box four, our activity, has to prop up box three. You know, I am a, I don't know what it might be. I, for example, you know, box three, for, I could be, I'm a church leader. That's an identity, a false primary identity you can fall into. And that, what that can mean is box four is, I therefore, if I'm, if I'm holding that as my main identity, I have to be very, very active and I have to be constantly, you know, crushing it. And my life becomes this exhausting roller coaster of sustaining this identity um, when actually God wants us to receive identity as a gift from God. So what I want us to do is to, we're going to get into little meeting rooms. I think Tim or someone is going to do this. And I want us just to have five, six, maybe give us seven minutes, Tim, if you're in charge of the time there. Give us seven minutes. And I want you just to, in your group, just to talk briefly um, about the identities that you tend to wear and what it feels like to, um, to have those as, as things you have to sustain in your life. So let me put it this way. What, what does your life of activity look like, box four, when you are trying to sustain that label, box three, other than the ones that God gives us? Does that make sense, some kind of sense? Talk a bit about what it feels like to be you when you've slipped into a kind of secondary label becoming your primary label and, um, and some of the telltale signs that you can see in yourself when you're not living in the good of the labels that God wants to give. We talked about um, how we have a tendency to strive mm. um, when we're more about what we do than about who God has made us or what God Brilliant. has made us. Just um, striving yes. and irritability and mm. yeah. That's great, Laura. One more. Another one we had was more sort of self-centered and prideful and, yeah. and less ready to sort of celebrate others, more ready to be a bit sort of grumpy or melancholy. That's so good. I mean, it's not good, but that's so insightful. Yeah. I think the phrase, the pendulum of between pride and despair, pride and despair is, is, is almost a summary, I think, where we're just, um, I mean, to connect to even with the previous series we did, we're not living in an emotionally healthy place. And so I think um, as we come to look at this series in Ephesians, I mean, today, really, I just wanted just to get us to even feel something of almost an awareness of both. Yes, we do long to have a sense of who am I? What is who am I? Am I what's my sense of self? But that the solutions that we tend to try and find and scrabble for that and you know just around us in this world they're not totally wrong but when they're primary they will lead to pride and despair striving exhaustion and it is so um extraordinary when bit by bit over time god the holy spirit starts to give you faith that if you're a christian here today by the grace of god you have been given a kind of treasure trove of new identities, new labels. That means you are not primarily a mum. You are not primarily a businessman. You're not primarily athletic. You're not primarily physically beautiful. Although all those things may be true, we're going to see over these next few weeks how God the Father in his kindness with great gentleness 
with no condemnation, wants to expose those kind of secondary or almost sometimes false labels and to say, no, 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 this is how I see you now through your connection with Jesus Christ. So let's just at least read a bit of scripture before we finish today, because just even the reading of scripture is a supernatural, powerful thing. I will make a couple of comments and then we will worship. And we can talk more about this in our sanctuary groups this week. So chapter one, verse one, Paul, here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So he understands his identity is by the will of somebody else. Somebody, he wasn't, he wasn't an apostle. He was a Christian killer and God has totally changed his identity as our kids have been learning week by week. He was one person. He is totally different. His, even his name has changed. I love the, the, the habit in the Bible of God changing names. That's so powerful. And even if that doesn't literally happen to you, there's something about the magnitude that he wants you to feel. And listen, if you would say you've, you've been like a cultural Christian, I know in the States, there's many who be like, I'm kind of a Christian because I'm around it. And you haven't felt the magnitude of the identity, cha identity change that the Bible says has happened to you when you truly get born again. Man, get ready to have your heart and your mind blown a little bit by the bigness of it. To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father. So even if your father in the natural realm, you would not see as synonymous with grace or truth. The father that we're going to be learning about who gives us this new identity Paul says, I want you to first of all think of grace when you think of your father and peace. Isn't that wonderful? Grace and peace and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go. Verse three. In the NIV, it says praise be. In the other translations, it says blessed be the Lord. I prefer that. Bless the Lord be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Okay, just a couple of minutes of comments on this and then we will worship. So Paul here in this opening benediction, it's one Greek sentence, I'm told, that is 220 words long. Paul was an enthusiast, I love that. Paul was not stoic. He was, he had a, you know, Paul wrote Romans, he was clever and he raised the dead. He did both, okay? He loved the word, he loved the spirit. He loved power and he loved intellect. He loved both of them. They weren't enemies. They were the best of friends. You do not have to throw your reason out to be a Christian. You don't have to do that. It is a reasonable thing to believe, as C.S. Lewis says. But Paul here, this enthusiast, starts with this incredible, massive sentence of glory to God. We're going to be thinking about ourselves over the next few weeks and the identity that Jesus gives us. But he can't help but start with worship. Praise be to the God and Father. He's a vertically minded man through and through and that is actually incredibly significant. We tend to just want to focus us on ourselves in life but right at the beginning Paul just is overflowing in praise to someone else. You know what it's like? Anyone here ever fallen in love before? Please, I hope there's one or two hands out there. Yeah, there's a few. When you fall in love or even if you have just a big fat crush on someone, what happens is your center of gravity shifts away from yourself, right? And you start to just, everything you connect with your true love, you know, you, you, everything, whatever it might be, the price of gas, and then you connect it with what your wife thinks about gas. I don't know. You, you, everything is like, yeah, but that's fine. But Jemima, or obviously in my case, Josie, she doesn't like gas. <laughs> and, and as a human, you are designed Listen, particularly if you're watching this and you say, I'm not a Christ follower. You're designed to have your eyes actually on someone else. And you see an echo of that. That's why every song that we ever listen to on the radio is about love, because it's an echo of this divine blueprint where you're meant to find your identity actually by seeing someone else. God, you made all things, your father and what he says about you through the work and the hard labor of somebody else. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, his sweat, his work, his toil, who God is and what God has done has given us the gift of salvation, redemption and a brand new identity. And we're going to go over this again and again. It's like a fine wine that we'll be drinking again and then smelling the aroma of it. The work of God 
is the only reason that we can talk about different labels. Um, but it's all glory to him. And he says these two things. He says, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. And this is so Paul with every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. So Paul here is this, this phrase here, every spiritual blessing is almost a headline for all of the other blessings that we're going to look at. Your identity is as a blessed, a, a, a super duper blessed one through Jesus and all of the specific blessings that we're going to look at week upon week upon week kind of come under this incredible beautiful opening headline of what it is to be a Christian which is you have now got not 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 that you will have in the future notice the tense you already have he has past tense blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ now listen some of you became Christians and you can't even remember the time you became a Christian. Maybe you were young. Maybe you always feel like you've been a Christian. And so it isn't this big, in your mind, dramatic thing. It's just, I, I've kind of always known Jesus. And that's, you know, however you come to Christ is fine. But what it can do is it can rob us sometimes of understanding the grandeur and the gravitas and the weight of what the Bible says your new identity now is. Every spiritual blessing. Just say that with me, even if you're muted. One, two, three. Every spiritual blessing. So your identity is not primarily any of those things that we've looked at. Your truest identity now, by the grace of God, is that you somehow, in a way that is difficult to grasp, God says through Paul, all those saints in Ephesus, even though many of them were not living great lives. All of us watching this who would say, by grace, I put my faith in Jesus. All of us now can say somehow I have every spiritual blessing. Not I will have when I die and get to be with Jesus. Right now, I already somehow am a blessed one. And that word blessing is so beautiful. You know, obviously the opposite is to be a cursed one, is to be someone who's under a heavy curse of like, oh, I'm defined by my past and my mistakes. This is saying, no, 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 you are by grace defined by the work of somebody else and you are a deeply blessed one. We are deeply spiritually blessed. Now, the idea of spiritual blessing, obviously, is primarily talking about the blessing of your inner life as a Christ follower now, rather than your physical life. It's a bit of an overstatement, but in many ways, the Old Testament talked a lot about physical things, the physical temple and the physical people. And then that wasn't, it's not that we are still physical beings and Christ even speaks about physical blessings, you know, to not worry about the food that you have. That's part of who we are, of course. But the Bible is saying, if you have faith in Jesus, that one thing, faith itself, is the most extraordinary spiritual gift from the King of Heaven that you could have never fabricated. You could have never generated. It was a gift. That one gift, faith, we're going to look at. Faith itself, trust in Jesus, even if you were just a little child, is in biblical terms... The, uh, just a monumental event it's a monument so if you for example feel conviction of sin that is a gift of the spirit it's a spiritual blessing when you feel love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control the fruit of the spirit that is an expression of every spiritual blessing in christ you and I are incredibly blessed as Christians. The other thing to notice, and I'd never noticed this before, but all the scholars mention this about this phrase, every spiritual blessing. It's not just emphasizing that these blessings are spiritual, although that's part of it. It's also it's spiritual in nature. It's also emphasizing that the source of these blessings is from the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? It's not just that they are spiritual things and we, you know, they're kind of invisible. No, no, he's saying that the source of the things that you now have access to as a Christ follower, 
are from a person, third person of the Trinity. They're personal. They're his gifts to you. They're real. They're specific. They're not just sort of vague, but they are from a person. The source of the blessing is from a person called the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Interestingly, though, it also says this phrase, he's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What does he mean by this phrase, heavenly realms? And I'll finish with this. The, hev- the idea of the heavenly realms is repeated, I think, four or five times throughout the book of Ephesians. Again, it's not talking about this mystical place that one day when you die, you float off and sit on a cloud in heaven. The heavenly realms are a dimension where God is particularly present right now. The heavenly realms is a present tense reality now. And this is where one of those things is quite, you know, the, the Bible effectively says when you become a Christ follower, you then become two people living in two places with two perspectives. Did you know that? Did you know now, as if you're a Christian, you are actually two people. You are physically on earth, on the earthly realm, but you now, through your connection with Christ, are also, just as in reality, now living in a heavenly realm with him. <laughs> I know you think I'm crazy, but I promise you we're going to see it's actually from the Bible. Uh, A very simple illustration that I've used with this, and it's not perfect because this is like deep, profound stuff, um, is if, would you use here the word loft in the States or attic? Attic, you know, the bit of a house at the top where you can store stuff. Someone American, can you give me a nod? What's the word you would use? Yeah, you get that. If you were to have a stepladder, and so you open the, la- you open the hatch and, and you go up the stepladder so your legs are still like in, on, the, uh, on the landing, you know. But your top part is now in the attic, okay? Imagine the attic is representative of the heavenly realms. And just imagine this is no just, you know, dusty, nasty attic. This attic is a treasure trove of glory and wonder. And you're up there like, wowzers, this place is incredible. This is an amazing realm of this house I didn't even know was here. Now, okay, that's not a perfect illustration, but it kind of helps you to visualize a little bit of what Paul is saying, is that now as a Christian, you are both a citizen of this earth still, but you are also, your inner being is being renewed day by day, and that you are now in another realm. So it is not true to say, therefore, that you only... If you're, if you're now two people living in two places with two perspectives, it means that we are constantly living in a, in a kind of good new tension. Like a conf, there's a new conflict you start to feel as a Christian that you don't feel beforehand. Because although physically you're still here, there is part of you now that is absolutely real. And uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his fantastic commentary, on uh, Ephesians, he makes this provocative point. He says that because of your union with Christ, you are now as spiritually alive as you will ever be. You are, because you're connected with Christ in the heavenly realms, you are as alive spiritually now as you will ever be. You've been raised with Christ. One day you will be physically raised with Christ. Your physical resurrection will catch up your spiritual resurrection, which has already occurred. But the Bible says that you, when you became a Christian, your identity was so radically changed that you, now through your intimacy with Christ, have been raised with Christ into the heavenly realms. So you are as spiritually alive now as you will ever be. Now, don't get me wrong. When you die and finally face to face you with Christ, you will be happier. Okay, hallelujah. All of the the effects of sin will finally be gone. Praise God. But biblically, I think it's true to say you won't be, in a sense, more spiritually alive because you are already intimately connected with Christ right now. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ. No doubt you will be more aware of that and you will enjoy it more and it will become more gloriously alive. Or another way of putting it is you are as spiritually secure now as you will be. Is that your union with Christ is absolute and complete. 
Now I know, I know. The, the, when, you, when you look at Ephesians, it's like eating a big steak, yeah? If you grab a whole bit of steak, you're going to be ill. So I found with Ephesians, and, and it's like you have to cut it into these tiny, like, kid-sized portions because every single concept is so, like, hard to get your head around, but you know, you, you know it's what you need. It's your meat. But it's, it's, almost, other, it's almost so hard to, to process. So we are, we are going to deliberately, over this next few weeks, as we look at these identities of what it is to be now in Christ. No, no longer am I primarily defined by a label that either I inherited Maybe your label growing up was, you're not as good as your sister. That was the label you've been carrying. And now, as a Christ follower, the father says, uh-uh, that needs to get out of town. Shame needs to go. You are now daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, you, and remember those boxes? You might think, I haven't done the thing, Tom. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the whole point. That's the good news. It's not good advice. It's good news. It's about what, who God is and what God has done, and who God has made you to be by grace, as a grace gift. You have changed, and your identity now will never, ever change. Your identity does not come in and out, depending on how your books for life is. It's a gift of God. And we're going to be, uh, week by week, asking God to change us, and to, to, to make us understand just the grandeur of what that truly is. So let me pray. And then we'll sing a final song to worship. And then we'll bring our meeting to an end. Father, Lord, this is heady stuff. And Jesus, we want to thank you, though, that you are so committed to birthing this church with men, women, and children who understand that, um, honestly, most of the time, we don't see ourselves like you do. We don't see ourselves as you do. And... I want to pray for an extraordinary Holy Spirit-led removal week by week, day by day, of labels that can lead to pride or despair, that they will just come off. And through the Word and through the Spirit, you will start to just bring revelation as to how, Father, you see us through the work of somebody else, that we are your beloved children, that we are so blessed that we are so blessed. We live physically on earth, but our inner beings now are united with Christ, seated in heavenly places. And I just pray, I even pray now for all of those who are either watching this on Facebook or Lord God who are on the Zoom call, would you just, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you just even now in these final moments, as we sing this final song, strengthen our hearts with grace and power. We cannot do this through mental gymnastics. This has to be the power of the Holy Spirit giving us revelation as to how you now see us. I pray for joy. I pray for freedom. I pray for excitement over these next few weeks. Just strengthen your family. And I just pray we'll just be like wowed at how much you've done. And where we've thought of being a Christian is this small part of our life almost. You'll just keep blowing up more and more and more. How come I've never seen this? This is who my father says I am. This is almost too good to be true. Lord, fill us with your presence and your joy and your perspective of us. And I pray that we will just be freed from shame and pride in Jesus' name. Amen.